Hello, hello. It is Tuesday at noon. Today we're going to be talking to Sarah Mason Teague, who I absolutely adore. We are one of those friend people who met online and have a lot in common, and she's been such a wonderful advocate of hello, of Brilliantly and the Brilliantly Warm development process. Here we're going to join in Sarah. All right, I think it's going to work. So Sarah, oh, hello, there you are, it worked. Can you hear me okay? Hi. Hi, are you in your car? Yes. I Can love it. Yes. I it's, am. It's so good. It's so COVID. It's like COVID mom <laughs> to the max. <laughs> oh my gosh, you have no idea. <laughs> so where are you? Um, I am in the parking lot. Um, I have a lunch here in a little bit and I didn't want to be driving. So I'm not driving, doing a live, not doing any of that. Um, I got myself a tea latte. So I'm here. I'm ready to oh, chat. Sweet. Well, thank you for fitting me in. It's like the busiest time ever. And I was just doing a little like quick intro on you, but I want you to do your own. I was saying, you know, we met online. We have talked a bunch of times about things we have in common and things that we think about. And, um, I feel like I really got to know you better in the last couple of months once we, um, you came to the caregiver event that Brilliantly and Erica and Tiffany and I did, and then we talked after it, and it's so, it made me like really rethink how I think about myself and my experience, because I just, I haven't talked to that many caregivers, so um, thanks for that, and I'll let you do your own little intro. Oh, wow. Um... Yeah, so I'm Sarah. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm a pre-viver. Um, I'm BRCA1 positive. I lost my mom to triple negative breast cancer um, in 2011, which just sounds so crazy to say because I feel like it's yesterday and then somehow we're approaching 10 years, which is insane to me. Um yeah, I have a, a three-year-old and um, I work full-time. Um, I do the angel project on the side, um, which is kind of, it has taken a different turn, but I'm really excited to come out with some announcements um, oh, later cool. on this month. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know, what am I missing? I think that's good. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I've loved having people sort of like, off the cuff do intros because some people are really good at like rattling off their stats and other people don't say them at all and are just like I'm a mom and I work and I do this and I do that so it's great to hear sort of the different ways people think about who they are and what they do and you do so many things I think you know I was thinking about you this morning and I was like what should we talk about because like we have talked about like exercising and trying to be strong and feel good in our bodies. We've talked about parenting. We've talked about caregiving. We've talked about being cold. Like I, it's interesting that like so much of what we've experienced as pre vivers feels like there's overlaps, even though we've never met in person, we've never hung out. We live in different places. I know. And hopefully after COVID that, that oh my God, I can't wait. I have this fantasy about um, brilliantly strong which I think is like one of the first things I talked to you about way back yeah. when I remember being in like one of those phone booths at a co-working space talking to you back when that was a thing and hearing about like fitness. And I don't, I can't remember because my brain Swiss cheese right now, like off the top of my head, y you are like, are you a coach? What is your, you have like a really positive relationship with fitness and health, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a bar instructor and I fell into that. I mean, I, I did bar before I had my double mastectomy. I was always super active. Um, but then after my double mastectomy, I got really insecure about, well, how do I go back to that place? Um, literally, not just mentally, but how yeah. do I actually go into that studio? Do I tell them that I've had this? Do I just pretend like I know all the modifications? What am I supposed to be doing? And I really lucked out because I was taking another like boot camp style class at the time. And 
um, the woman just knew me really well and we were able to have those kind of open conversations and she would actually write me a completely different workout than the rest of the class because I needed all of the modifications. I started working out. My surgery was at the, you know, like mid August. And I think the end of September is when I started to work out again. So it was relatively new. Um, and I just, I never forgot her generosity and her willingness to let me be vulnerable and say, okay, listen, I'm going to need the wall. I'm going to need a chair. I'm just going to look completely different than the rest of these people. And she allowed that space there. And so when I got certified in bar, that is the kind of class I wanted to do. I wanted to make people feel like no matter your age, your physical abilities, you were welcome here. And I was going to help you where I was going to meet you where you were at. You, you didn't have to set this expectation for yourself. And so when, when I did that, then I started to become super judgmental of other instructors <laughs> when they weren't, I know, terrible. No, but like I, 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 you know, but you do that, right? Like you, you, you would go to someone's class and then I would be pissed that someone didn't ask me if I was hurt. Right. Or someone didn't ask me if I needed modification. And so, um, so those were things that I would try to help other instructors do because as women, we don't want to say, oh, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be that one in the back, probably groaning because I can't get off the floor or I'm going to be like rolling around because I need different things than, uh, than other people. Um, so it's yeah, so true. It's really, it I mean, I love that you had that experience because I remember when I first went back to yoga being embarrassed to tell anybody and there was, I didn't know any of the instructors very well. And there was one woman who I was like, okay, she's in her forties. Like she's old enough that she probably knows someone or has a friend who's had some experience with breast cancer. And so maybe it's a thing she's at least thought about. And of course that's me being ageist, right? Like just thinking that. <laughs> Like the really young women maybe would be like, well, I don't know, do whatever you want. And it's like, well, I don't know what I want to do. And when I told this woman who I absolutely love and adore, she just cried. And she was like, one of my best friends just had breast cancer, but I don't really know how to help you just do what feels good. And I was like, well, that's not. And then I felt like a spectacle or something. Like I didn't know how to ask for what I need because I didn't know what I needed. And yeah. I think um, it's great that you're doing that. And there's more women, you know, like I've seen more people kind of popping up on my feed who are focused on health and wellness and actual physical exercise and they show you modifications and it's so important. And, mm -hmm. you know, my post COVID fantasy is that I can have a little retreat for a bunch of people to do our second round of brilliantly strong because oh. I couldn't, it would like at one, I just like am really craving being in the same space with other people. And two, it's something that we, it just got totally backburnered that project, but I feel really passionate about it because when I first started participating in, at all in the breast cancer community, it was a thing I heard almost universally from everyone is like, I don't feel strong. I don't know how to work out. I have limited strength. My mobility is terrible. Like, and I don't have time or no one told me to go to physical therapy. So I think it's like, I'm just really excited to collaborate on that with people yeah. and hopefully, you know, figure out a way to fly all of you amazing women who are doing that here or somewhere that would be have like, so fun yeah, yeah i mean i'm so like fun. planning all kinds of huge things and i'm like i don't know maybe it'll happen <laughs> hey i sign me up i'm totally ready um i think that that i don't know the whole project because i i mean even at the time that you and i talked i was trying to do something too um and then of course life happens and it also got put on the back burner but I started to do a breast cancer awareness event called scars are beautiful and I would offer a free community class to all um, breast cancer survivors thrivers um, even you know people with ovarian cancer whatever I just would open it up to the community um, because most gyms don't know. I mean, I'm not going to do burpees for boobies. No one wants to see me do burpees or pay me money to do that. 
So I was trying to think of ways, like, how do you actually give back to the women that need something? So I did two years of that. Of course, COVID interrupted the third year. But that was my way of inviting them into the space completely free of charge. I tried to do, like, fun raffles and, um, you know, smoothie drinks and things like that. Um, But more importantly, it was a chance to get them in the space and teach them ways for them to move their body and if they wanted to come back for class great but really it was just about them coming together and being in a room of other women that had different um you know different abilities and different issues and being like oh wow well I mean this girl next to me is is able to do this surely I can too right yeah I think it's really awesome and inspiring and I'm I hope that like there is a future where I have the opportunity to make that kind of experience available virtually where you don't have to be in a specific location and have somebody who like you, who can tell you it's really hard to learn how to move your body again. Like, I don't know about you, but I spend months just sort of like (laughs) in this weird hunch, like protecting myself. And I still now, like we have a mirror in our like, kitchen dining area and when I walk by it I'm always like stand up straight like I still don't feel like I stand up straight I know I know my husband sometimes will catch me and he'll be like Sarah you were literally like at an angle and he'll come and kind of like put you know force me to put my shoulders back and even I don't know if it's just me but when I for some reason when I walk upstairs I walk upstairs like an 80 year old woman like literally I'm walking in my back you know, I'm at an angle and I'm going up and I'm like, why do I do that? I don't have to lean. (laughs) I don't have to lean forward to go up the stairs. I'm going to have to notice how I move because I think that's a huge part of all of this, right? Is like just noticing how you move and that it's different and that it feels different. Like I've never thought about how I walk upstairs, but now it's going to be a whole new thing to be self-conscious about. (laughs) my gift to you today (laughs) yeah no thank you because it's all you know like there are appropriate ways to move and the woman who we collaborated with for the first brilliantly strong her name's Catherine, and she does postpartum corrective exercises because it's the same thing and i know you're a mom you've been through this like everything your hips move differently your pelvic floor feels different your stomach muscles aren't as like you know like there's just so many parts (laughs) to moving safely like and we all want to be able to jump on a trampoline and not wet our pants. So it's, you know, figuring you out, <laughs> get all of the things to a way that you can live your life and move safely and feel good. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, so I, I meant to ask this, is your blog called Gathering Stones? Is that what your, your IG handle? Mm-hmm. And yeah. is, you, is it still active or is that where you shared your, yeah, it is awesome. Yeah, it's still active. I haven't written anything in a while. Um, but yeah, it's still active. It has a resource page. Uh, it's where I sell my angels. Um, yeah, you want to tell us a little bit about your angels? Because I feel like I just found out about it like in the last six months. I didn't know about it until then. Yeah, so it started as my what do I want to do for breast cancer awareness for October And typically my stance, because October is just hard enough for everyone, especially in this community, usually my stance is to stand on a soapbox and preach, like, don't buy pink products and, you know, whatever. And I just decided that that's not the approach I wanted to take this year. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to put my money where my mouth was. So my mom used to sew and she made these angels and, um... I was trying to figure out what kind of thing I wanted to do. And I just was like, I could make these. I, I still had the templates. I still had all of her stuff. I knew nothing about sewing. But, you know, just like any good entrepreneur, you YouTube and you figure it out. Uh-huh. And, um, and I got my mother-in-law on board to help me because she was the only one close that knew anything about sewing. And... Um, so yeah, so what I did was I I put together these angels and I dedicated them to women I knew that had passed from breast cancer. So I made them collections and um, and then I assigned a charity to each collection. And my deal was if you make a donation to one of these charities, 
you send me the receipt, I'll send you an angel. Oh, I love it. And, um, and so, so I wanted to do it that way. So people knew it, it wasn't a scheme. It wasn't about me making money. It was about you making an impact. And so there were about, um, I think six different collections. Um, and, um, anyway, it kind of took off and then people started to ask me what I honor other types of cancers. Um, would, would I include men? Did they have to, did they have to be deceased to be honored? Which I, at first I was like, well, no. And then I realized everyone was deceased in my collections. And so anyway, after that, I decided to open it up to all types of cancers um, and then I did start charging cause I didn't want to go broke. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what I did was I, I, I made collections for January or for, um, November and December and that month honored, um, pancreatic and lung cancer. And so I did, um, I did some really cute, um, RBG angels um, those were the ones where I, I feel like those were the first ones I saw. And then I went back and was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that. Um, and then I did some for lung. I did two, I think for pancreatic and then I did one for lung cancer. And then I still included one for breast cancer because that's why I started. And I felt like yeah. every month I was going to include that. And so I charged, um, I charged $40 and then, um, and that included shipping and then $10 for every purchase went to the charity. So we raised money for the lung cancer research foundation and, um, the pancreatic action network. Awesome. And it just, was, it was really interesting because I think we forget all of the cancer worlds are siloed and, yeah. and me reaching out to these other research foundations. I mean, they were floored. They were just like, you came out of nowhere. You want to help us. You, you're not a lung cancer survivor or a pancreatic cancer survivor, but you want to help us like that is freaking amazing. So totally. And you know, I think breast cancer has had such a successful marketing campaign, right? Like the awareness component has happened and there's so many other cancers and they are devastating. And the people who survive them have the same long-term yeah. issues that everyone in our community is experiencing. So I'm sure they were really touched. That's such a beautiful thing to do. Yeah. So, um, so I, I stopped because I was trying to figure out, you know, okay, is this worth it? Do people actually like them? Is it creepy? I don't know. So I kind of have spent the last couple of months kind of redesigning them and trying to figure out was I going to just open it up to all types of cancers? Did I still want to do collections, which I've decided I do because that's what makes it personal. Um, mm -hmm. So I've, I've kind of created a channel where you can nominate people. Oh, I love that. And so, and they don't have to be dead. <laughs> they can, they can be living, um, you know, men and women. And um, so, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll open that up and then I'll have different designs um, available, but it just, it, it gives people, I think, um, not just a way to honor, but also to connect, you know, especially we all have family members that we don't know what to buy for. And I got a ton of orders around Christmas time for people that wanted to give to family members mm -hmm. to honor right. other, other people. I love that. That's such a beautiful gesture. I was just thinking too, that I bet you could find women who do enjoy sewing in the community to like donate them. So you don't have to make them all. It's such a huge, I think that's one of the things that happens. Like if you stumble into a project that's really exciting and get some traction, it's like, okay, how do you scale that? You have a certain amount <laughs> yeah. of time. Exa well, exactly. And like, you know, some people, um, everyone's different. Some people love, to mat, you know, like, okay, I'm just going to use the pink ribbon for, for the example, but like some people want a pink angel if it's breast cancer and some people want a black angel if it's breast cancer. And so it's like, well, how do you, 
how do you make the range because everyone wants something different and so that was the biggest issue too was well I can't just make a thousand different angels and then hope that it speaks to you this month um so yeah so definitely trying to figure out the designs and how I wanted to to fix that part um but I really enjoyed the educational part of it too because I think to your point everyone that lives in these different cancer worlds it's interesting learning about um the things that that go on like for instance pancreatic and lung cancer are so underfunded it's not even funny how underfunded they are and so just bringing that awareness out to other people because it's you know breast cancer is always going to be my thing that's 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 it but from someone that lives in the cancer world I'm always going to care about cancer so having that platform to to educate other people of what's going on in those different worlds I think is really important yeah absolutely and I think you know there's something to being women and young women where we are in a moment where we really have a lot of permission to talk about our experience and share it on social media and write about it and blog about it but there are people who feel really isolated in their cancer experience, especially if it's one that people don't know about or is underfunded. I don't think men are as willing and open to share and be vulnerable. You know, like it's, it's such a huge problem and I feel like we're on the precipice of it and that breast cancer has the opportunity to sort of pave the way for like, hey, you can share your stories, you can feel less alone, you can, you know, that Instagram, these platforms, we're like one click away from meeting someone who completely understands us. And I think that, you know, that's going to continue to happen, hopefully, in all the different cancer spaces, because, you know, you know, you're in, you're part of the breasties, too, that, like, people, other women, other young women who've had different cancers are like, hey, can I join? Can I, like, I haven't had breast cancer, but there isn't a young pancreatic cancer or lung cancer or, you know, like, it, it doesn't need to be as siloed as it is, I think, is my point. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's exactly right. Well, that's a really awesome project. And if you need help sewing, we are over <laughs> here learning. I, I used to do quite a bit of sewing. I'm not very good at it, but my daughter has just, her interest was piqued. So the sewing machine literally is out in the kitchen all the time now. And we have <laughs> many it. half projects, but if you need help, feel free to ask. I will help you or crowdsource other people to help too. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Have you started sewing other things? Like, have you become someone who loves sewing? I have not actually. Um, and it's so funny because my mom, she, she crocheted, she knitted, she sewed, um, she uh, did uh, needlepoint. I mean, she did everything. And I was sitting on probably, I'm not exaggerating, nine boxes of sewing stuff. Um, and I went through all of it. Wow. And I, I donated a lot of the stuff to, there's a local organization here that teaches um, refugee women how to sew so they can basically make a living for their family. And they offer classes and material, and whatever. And so I gave them a lot of my mom's stuff because I was just like, I'm never going to learn how to crochet. I just, yeah. it's just not in my wheelhouse. Um, but it has given me such a, uh, I think I've been surprised on how much I enjoy making and designing. It's a, it's, it's so different from exercising and working and it, that it actually fills me up because I think when I first started, my dad was really afraid that it was going to depress me and not be something I enjoyed, but it was kind of the opposite that I, because it was such an, an, escape for me but to be able to use my creativity it really filled me up um so it, it didn't drain me like I think he thought it was going to so that's been the most fun is just like looking at different fabrics and materials and totally um, there's like a meditative quality once you're like in the rhythm of making something and making all of those yeah. visual choices and I don't know like we do we all do so much work that's like or on a call or on video and actually physically making stuff with your hands. Yeah. Like there's, it just doesn't happen as much. So when it does, it feels special. Well, and I was laughing because I'm such a control freak 
that it feels so good to like talk about something. And I'm sure you get this too, where you talk about it and you draw it on a piece of paper, but then you actually are holding it in your hand and you're like, this is it, this thing right here. Um, yeah. And so it was just, it's a, yeah, it's very therapeutic to kind of go through that process. And at the end you're like this thing, this tangible thing you can feel, um, is my finished project. Totally. You know, I'm glad you brought up your dad because it's one of those things I, and my dad's not on Instagram, so I feel safe to talk about him here. I, he, I'm in this moment where we haven't physically been in the same space in such a long time. And, you know, you and I chatted and it's not even really in the, our interview too much about what happens when you're like a caregiver with someone. And we were both caregivers with our dads and you feel that like deep connection to them that whole time. And you're working as a team and you're doing all this stuff and you're intuiting what they need and what your person needs. Like for both of us, it was our mom. And then what happens after that? And we're both now you're like about a decade out and I'm over 15 years out and like how you still sort of have to rebuild this relationship outside of the war zone of cancer. And I was going to ask how you and your dad are doing, because I feel currently confused about my relationship with mine. <laughs> yeah. I, um, so I'm an only child and, um, and I think that has something to do with it, but my dad and I have always really been close. I mean, when I was little, so my mom had me and then she went to law school. So my dad actually quit his job and stayed at home to raise me really while my mom was in law school for four years. And I think that really helped um, kind of solidify our relationship. I mean, believe me, there's times that I'm, I'm way like my dad in terms of my, my temperament and my decisions and my worrying and whatever. But, um, but I think that there's something uh, going through the trauma, but then also, I mean, he's my only parent that I have left. And so even on the days that I am absolutely just so mad with him or he's mad with me or whatever, I think there's this kind of understanding of, I don't have the luxury to be mad at you forever. Right. Totally. And, I, and I don't want to waste that time. Um, and I think that is, that's helped. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that it's perfect because God, it is, it's not perfect, but I, I am, um, I'm a lot more intentional uh, than I used to be. Yeah. I think so too. Right. Like you realize how precious the time with them is. I think that the, one of the things I struggle with um, is like how to, how to reconnect. And it's funny that it's been 15 years of like figuring that out because there are some um, relationships with anybody, right? That like ebb and flow and change and it always feels like easy and, and, and intentional and you're focused on maintaining it in a way that makes it like, okay, well, we're changing, but that's cool. And, or friends who you haven't seen in five years, but when you get together, it's like exactly the same. And exactly. I think other people that it feels like it takes more work. Um, and I'm in a moment where somehow it feels like work, but I want to do the work, which I guess is different for some people who maybe haven't had that experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, but um, I think the I think in my imagination, it would be a different experience if it was my mom and, you know, my mom and I going through the trauma about my dad. Like, I think it would have been completely different in, in how I needed to um, handle that and, and, you know, how I think she would have responded. But I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, I shouldn't say fortunate. It's not fortunate, but my dad had already gone through, um, you know, extreme losses with his parents. He lost his dad suddenly to a heart attack when he was 13. Oh, wow. And then, and then his mom died from inflammatory breast cancer, like not even a year after he married my mom. And um, so he was already kind of equipped with the trauma. And I'm, I'm not saying that people need that, but he already had experienced it. So it wasn't fresh. It wasn't a brand new thing. Um, and I, and I think that helped in a way where he didn't just completely, I mean, 
believe me, there were days when he completely shut down, but I think it would have been different had this been his first real loss. Yeah, it's crazy, right? How like, for some people, that first loss for us, like, when it's your first time going through it, you like fall off a grief cliff. And for other people, yeah. it's like part of an ongoing thing. So well, yeah. I'm glad things are good with you guys. And I think that um, the remaining parent, because this, you know, there's lots of women who are part of the genetic cancer community, whose dads have died from pancreatic cancer. Like, we don't know who it comes from, right? Like, or we, we can find out. But I think it's one of those things. Exactly. That, like, you know, the, the parent who's remaining has to take the role of both parents. And that's really hard. So, yeah. Well, I loved talking to you. I always love Thank talking you. to you. I hope you have a wonderful lunch. Thanks for Thank you. fitting me in in the car. I love it. The mobile office. And Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. And for people to find out about your angel project and upcoming announcements and stay in touch, is your Instagram the best place to do that? Instagram's perfect. Okay, sweet. We'll link to it. And uh, I'll talk to you soon, Sarah. Okay. Sorry. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.